Hi, I'm author Elizabeth Rush, and thank you for joining me today. Um, I'm going to be talking a little bit about my background and my books and hopefully offering you lots of resources that you can use um, both online and when you get back in the classroom. So um, to start, I wanted to um, tell you a little bit about what I was like when I was in school. Um, ever since I was a little girl, I loved all subjects and um, was really interested in how things were connected. I loved reading and writing and science and math and social studies and geography and art and history and music. And, um, you know, one of the big puzzles for me, um, you know, as I grew up through middle school, high school, and even college is, you know, what would I, what would I do as a career? Because I was interested in everything and I really didn't like the idea of picking one thing. And I was also really interested in how different things in the world are connected. So um, I was um, delighted um, when I figured out a career that is perfect for me. Um, being an author, being a writer um, is, is um, just a wonderful solution to my problem because I can write about anything in the whole world that interests me. So I've published uh, 15 books uh, for young readers and over 100 magazine articles for adults and also some for young readers as well. And one of the things that I love about it is that anything in the whole world that interests me is something that I can write about. So um, I write about science and history and music and art and nature and politics and um, just anything in the whole world that interests me is something that I can write about. But there is a problem with being interested in everything, especially as an author. And that is that um, one of the problems is that kids have to search all over the library for my books. So, you know, if I was a fiction author, you'd be able to go to Elizabeth Rush and get all my books in a row. Um, but that's not true with me as a, as a nonfiction and fiction writer. Um, and also I write for kids, uh, basically birth through adult. So my books are also shelved in all different age levels. Um, I thought this uh, bulletin board was really interesting. Oh, I was doing a school visit once and there was this giant bulletin board that had a bunch of my books with a Dewey Decimal System um, numbers with them, basically like as a map so that kids could find my books all over the library. And what's tricky about that is that like if a kid reads, say one of my books about science and they like my writing and there's something about the book that they like, they may not necessarily find my other work, which may also be appealing to, him, uh, to them as well. So that can be a little bit of a challenge as an author, um, both in reaching my audience and also, you know, kind of building a group of readers who like to read me. But I would say that um, there is actually a lot of things that connect my books together. And what I wanna talk about is how you can use my books to help kids make connections and also um, in this crazy time, how you can do this um, virtually. So I'm gonna start with um, kind of an overview of my books um, as background. And um, I understand that the audience kind of ranges from elementary, middle, and high school. And actually I write for all those different audiences and I write fiction and nonfiction, and I even have a graphic novel and a couple of graphic novel type books. So this is just to give you a sense of uh, of my work and I can, um, since this is a little cozier, I actually have some books here that I can show you the interiors of, which will be fun. So um, I've kind of booked, uh, grouped my books according to, you know, topics that I'm interested in. So one thing that I really love is the arts. Um, I have a number of books about art and music. Um, one is called A Day With No Crayons. It's fiction, a picture book for kids ages three to eight. Um, and basically it tells the story of a little girl who um, colors on her walls and her, her mom takes her crayons away and she has to find color in the world around her. So it's really about kind of the question of what, a bar, uh, what, a, what happens when a budding artist can't use her crayons and has to find other ways to make art. Um, it's a very popular book um, and I have on my website lots of um, um, activities that you can do uh, related to that book. I'll talk about that later. 
Um, I have a, a book called The Music of Life, Bartolomeo Cristofori and the Invention of the Piano. And this is a true story. It's a picture book, narrative nonfiction. Um, and so it's a biography of the actual guy who invented the piano. Um, so this book is really kind of a mashup of biography, music, history, and invention. Um, and I just noticed that my, uh, my slides aren't quite right. <laughs> I think I moved things around. Um, so uh, you'll just have to bear with me with that. Just switch the text underneath. Um, anyway, uh, The Music of Life also is illustrated by a Marjorie uh, Priceman who just did the most beautiful illustrations for this book. I just wanna show you some of them. And one of the features of this book too is that um, it tells the story of Bartholomew Cristofori and it's all based on um, primary sources. And so on the pages, there's actually the primary source material that was the inspiration for this page. So on this page, um, Cristofori has made his first piano and I have down here at the bottom, I'll read, it says 1700 Florence, a new invention that makes the piano and the forte with its red leather covered cover lined with green taffeta and hemmed with golden ribbon. And this is from the Medici Inventory of Instruments. So um, one of the things that um, you can do with this book is also use it as a mentor text um, with older students um, as a way to show how you can use primary sources to inspire a story. Um, another uh, kind of music history book that I have is a narrative nonfiction called For the Love of Music. And it's the true story of uh, Maria Anna Mozart, who was Wolfgang Mozart's sister. She was also a child prodigy and in fact was thought to be um, uh, the better pianist. Um, Maria Mozart uh, also composed music and we know that it was beautiful because uh, Wolfgang Mozart said in his letters that it was, um, that it was beautiful. And so it tells a story about how she was Wolfgang Mozart's earliest musical inspiration, how they traveled through Europe giving concerts, how she was ultimately left home when she was of marriageable age, and how she kept music in her life anyway. One of the interesting things about this book is that I structured it um, like a piano sonata. So that was one of Maria Anna Mozart's favorite forms. And so I structured the whole book around the form of the piano sonata. So in that sense, it's also can also be a really powerful mentor text. Um, I've always been fascinated with science um, and space exploration. Um, I have a picture book called The Planet Hunter, the story behind what happened to Pluto. Um, this is a narrative nonfiction picture book, and it's basically a biography of uh, Mike Brown, who is an astronomer who asked a pretty bold question. Is it possible there are more planets in the solar system than we have ever found? And he started looking and he uh, started finding things, some things that were smaller than Pluto and eventually something that was bigger than Pluto that actually changed the way we look at our solar system. So I wrote that book as an explanation uh, for young people about why Pluto is not considered a planet anymore. And it's also really interesting because it shows that uh, science is really um, uh, a process. And like when I was a kid and I memorized the nine planets, you know, science isn't just memorizing facts. It's also um, our understanding of the solar system changes. And this is a great story of that. Um, the Mighty Mars Rovers, I write for a, a series um, that Houghton Mifflin publishes called Scientists in the Field. And if you don't know the series, you should check it out. It has wonderful, um, it's wonderful narrative nonfiction about science. What we do as writers is we follow scientists into the field and bring their work to life. And in a sense, bringing readers um, into the field with scientists as they're doing their work. Um, there are a lot of these books that are actually about animal scientists. I tend to write a little bit more about um, engineering and invention. Um, so uh, two of my books are on this slide. One is called The Mar Mighty Mars Rovers. Um, it's for ages 10 and up. And um, basically it tells the greatest space robot adventure story ever. Um, 
uh, two Mars rovers, Spirit and Opportunity, were sent to have a three-month mission looking for signs of water on Mars. And these rovers lasted three months and then six months and then a year and then three years and then six years. Um, they were designed to go on flat terrain and these uh, Mars rovers climbed Martian mountains and went deep into Martian craters. And I tell the story through uh, Steve Squires, who was the, um, the head of the mission and his team. And um, so really telling the experience through the scientists who were cheering these, um, these space robots along on their journey and worrying about them. Um, and one of my favorite things about this book is uh, some of the reviews that I got, um, the reviewer said that um, the book made them cry. And so, you know, one of the things that I try to do with my science stories is really have it be a human, a, a human story, um, something that, um, you know, where the readers will actually feel something as well as learning about science. Um, another kind of space science exploration book that I have is Impact, Asteroids the, and the Science of Saving the World. Um, this is also a, a scientist in the field book. Um, and basically in this book, um, it was inspired by the asteroid that blew up over the Russian city of Chelyabinsk. Um, and it was a asteroid explosion um, that scientists didn't see coming. And so it sort of set me off on a quest trying to figure out, you know, what asteroids are out there in space, what are scientists doing to understand what's out there, um, how we're figuring out if there are any that are on a collision course with Earth. Um, and I put that together into this book, um, Impact. I want to show you just a couple of spreads. Two of the cool things that I did for this book is, um, one is that I actually got to go on a, um, an, a meteorite hunt. So when a space rock falls to grant to the ground, um, you can see in this sidebar over here, scientists use Doppler weather weather radar to track where the rocks that um, have hit the atmosphere and blown up and fallen to the ground where they may have fallen and then basically the scientists walk through the fields looking it's kind of a it's like a game of like one of these things is not like the other looking for a space rock um, the other thing that I did is that I stayed up all night with astronomers who basically stay up all night at observatories um, searching for asteroids in the night sky and when I did this um, it was pretty quiet until about midnight and then um, at about at about midnight we started finding things that had never been tracked before um, after a few hours, we found a few more things. By the end of the night, we had found 10 asteroids that had never been tracked before. So um, that's an example of how, uh, you know, I kind of take students into the field with me, with scientists as they're doing their work. So a friend once asked me um, how I got obsessed with volcanoes. And I laughed and said, I'm not obsessed with volcanoes. And she said, well, you've written three books about volcanoes. So that certainly seemed like an obsession. Um, and I admit that maybe it is. Um, I, my books, I kind of call them cradle to grave volcano books. So the first one's called Volcano Rising. It's a nonfiction picture book um, that basically is about the creative power of volcanoes. Um, the most common kind of eruption is actually not the big blasting eruption that gets all the press, but it's this very gentle eruption called a dome building eruption. And um, it's these eruptions that create mountains and create islands um, where there were none before. And one of the things that I love about this book is the illustrations. Um, Susan Swan, the illustrator, did these really cool collage illustrations. And the other thing that we did in this book is we have read aloud text 
that you can read to very young kids. Um, and then below that, there's this little text that gives you a lot more information. So like this page says, creative eruptions can continue for a really long time. Whoosh, fountains of red hot lava squirt high into the air, gurgle. Stinky lava streams to the shore. Tss. Fluid lava hits the ocean steaming and hardens to form new land. And then this tiny text down here tells all about the eruption uh, that kind of is on and off at Kilauea, um, building the Hawaiian islands and causing them to continue to grow. Uh, the next book in that kind of age by age series is called Will It Blow? Become a Vo Volcano Detective at Mount St. Helens. And it is for ages about six to 10. And in it, I tell the story of an eruption that not the big 1980 eruption, but an eruption that happened between 2004 and 2008, when Mount St. Helens started to grow back. And I write about Mount St. Helens from the point of view of the scientists who were monitoring Mount St. Helens and trying to figure out what it was going to do. And so um, what I do is I talk about volcano monitoring as if it's a mystery that they have to solve and the clues that the scientists have to look at to figure out what Mount St. Helens or any volcano is going to do. And then the, uh, the book for older students is called Eruption. Um, it is also narrative nonfiction for ages 10 and up. It's part of that Scientists in the Field series. And in it, um, I tell the story of a small group of scientists who travel all around the globe when a volcano rumbles to life. And they, um, they fly in to try to predict eruptions so that they can evacuate people and get them out of the way. And these, this small group of scientists have saved literally hundreds of thousands of people's lives and nobody really knows about it because when lives are saved, it doesn't make the news. Um, so this book is full of dramatic stories and photos of real volcanic eruptions um, and the scientist's role in helping to get people um, to safety before they erupted. Um, I tend to write a lot about kind of problem solving and technology and invention. Um, I have a picture book biography called Electrical Wizard, um, which is about Nikola Tesla. It's for ages six to 12. Um, and in this story, I tell, you know, a lot about Tesla's early life, um, you know, things that he did as a child, one of which was he um, was playing in a stream and he took a disc of wood and put a, a stick through it and then put that disc into the water and then watch the water spin the wheel, which was um, his early inspiration for um, the hydroelectric dam that he was ultimately behind building in Niagara Falls. Um, I also, this book also really captures sort of this moment in history when the world went from um, being lit basically with gas and candlelight to being lit by electricity. Um, and it has some really beautiful illustrations of the Chicago World's Fair, which was the first time it was lit by electricity. Um, this book also has um, really extensive scientific notes about um, you know how electricity works and um, how Tesla's AC motor works and um, how hydroelectric power works. So it's kind of a blending of um, you know this narrative story with a lot of really hard science behind it. Uh, the next wave is another uh, scientist in the field book. Um, it's a you know, obviously a true story about the quest to harness the power of the oceans. Um, so this is basically like, you know, maybe 25 years ago, um, you know, wind energy was being developed and people were making windmills of different sizes and the blades were really different. Well, that's happening now with wave energy. Uh, scientists are trying to harness the up and down motion of the waves and the in and out movement of the tides um, to create electricity. 
and um, they're wildly creative and they have lots of different ideas that they are testing. And I um, tell those stories through the book, The Next Wave. Um, so you'll also notice that, you know, a couple of my other books that were in other categories also fit into this technology and invention category. Um, the asteroid book uh, also covers, there's a whole chapter on, if we do ever find an asteroid that's coming toward Earth, um, you know, what are we going to do about it? And there are lots of people who are addressing that problem and creating inventions and having ideas, things like blasting the asteroid with white paint, and then the solar radiation might actually move the asteroid slowly out of the way. Um, grabbing it in a giant net and dragging it off its course. Um, so there's a, a fair amount about invention in that book. And then The Music of Life, uh, I mean, The Music of Life, which is about the invention of the piano, you know, it's about music, but it's also about solving the problem of creating a keyboard instrument that can play both softly and loudly. So there are other books of mine that may not look like science books that end up being quite scientific. Um, I have a book called Mario and the Hole in the Sky, How a Chemist Saved Our Planet. And that book is basically meant as kind of a story of hope um, in this time of global climate change when kids are aware of climate change and they think that there's nothing we can do about it. Um, the fact of the matter is we've actually endangered our planet once before with uh, CFCs destroying our ozone layer. And I write about the scientist, Dr. Mario Molina, who's a Mexican-American chemist who was part of figuring out uh, that we were endangering our ozone layer. And, um, and the book also addresses how the world came together and addressed the problem. So it's a story of hope. Um, I love dogs and I have a couple of, uh, of dog books. Uh, these are also true stories. Um, and even though they're fun stories about dogs, I managed to kind of weave in science. I'll give you an example. My new book, Gidget, the Surfing Dog, um, Catching Waves with a Small but Mighty Pug. So this is a true story of a, uh, a little pug who Alicia adopted basically as a companion for her other pug, but uh, Gidget was like a crazy handful who charged around the house and chewed on the furniture. And Alicia was just, you know, desperate to give this, this dog something to do. And she tried dog agility um, and she got goats to keep this pug company. And then one day at the beach, she was walking with Gidget and a friend had a surfboard and um, they said, oh, well, let's plop Gidget on the surfboard. And Gidget rode the board all the way into the, um, to the beach. And that was the start of Gidget surfing. She is a world-class um, uh, champion dog surfer. So in this book, it's full of just the most fun photos of dogs surfing. Um, after the first year that Gidget was surfing, she actually fell ill and um, has a chronic illness that she um, has to deal with, but she has continued to be a world-class surfer. Um, you could see in these photos how Gidget like actually like directs the surfboard. But then I sneak in a little bit of science. This is the physics of surfing. Um, so I talk about buoyancy and I talk about how torque and how uh, how she moves on the board actually um, directs the, the movement of the board. I have another pretty brand new book that I co-wrote with my teenager Izzy Rush. It's called A Search for the Northern Lights and it's uh, basically the story of... Um, a mother daughter kind of based on our story um, who are searching for the Northern Lights and have to learn about the Northern Lights and face a lot of challenges along the way. One of the things I love about this book is the art is spectacular. Cedar Lee, who is a Portland artist, does just gorgeous paintings of the natural world. This is her rendition of an aurora, just gorgeous. 
Um, but even though it's a story, you can read it aloud or kids can read it to themselves, but I always include lots of scientific notes. And this is about how auroras are formed and um, uh, how, the, how the solar radiation um, uh, mixes with the molecules in the atmosphere to make the colors and why there's a 27 day cycle of auroras and all kinds of scientific information. And then we learned a lot about searching for an aurora and how challenging it is because you have to have a solar storm and it has to be dark and you have to be away from uh, light pollution and you need clear weather and how you get all that together. We created a step-by-step -step guide to searching for the aurora, which is basically what I wish I had had when we were searching. Um, I've always been interested in um, the world and in activism and citizenship. The Mario Molina book is, is one of those. One of my first books was called Generation Fix, Young Ideas for a Better World, which were stories of young people who saw a problem in their community and did something about it. Um, my newest work on this level is for high schoolers, college, really smart middle schoolers. It's called You Call This Democracy? How to Fix Our Government and Deliver Power to the People. So in this book, I talk about things like the Electoral College and gerrymandering, the role of money in our politics, the youth vote. Um, and so I really look at how our government really functions today and what citizens are actually doing to, um, to try to make our democracy function more smoothly. So this just came out uh, March 31st. Um, it's in hardcover paperback, audio, and Kindle. Um, and uh, I'm really proud of this book. It has, in addition to um, a lot about these different topics, it also has these really wonderful um, infographics uh, to kind of bring some of these issues to life like this infographic talks about voter turnout in the United States compared to the rest of the world. So we have, you know, usually about half of our population voting and about half of our population not voting. So the United States is way down here, you know, where other industrialized countries have way more people voting. So the other thing I try to do is put things in context internationally. Um, I really love graphic novels and I love the kind of a graphic novel approach and I have used that approach in several books. Um, one is just a straight graphic novel called Muddy Max um, for, uh, it's a middle grade book about a boy who gets superpowers when he's completely covered in mud. Um, and he has one problem, one very serious problem, and that's that his parents um, freak out when he has even the tiniest bit of mud on his body. So he gets superpowers when he's muddy, but he has to be totally clean for his parents. So that creates a lot of tension. And it turns out there's actually a dark side to the mud. So that's a, a graphic novel that I have. Um, I have a picture book called Ready, Set, Baby, which is a book for families that are expecting a second, third, fourth, fifth child. And this is actually based on interviews that I did with young people about what it's like to have a new baby in the family. So it's really kids giving advice to other kids about what this is like. And there's a fair amount of humor in it because kids' perspectives are really funny. In this section um, right here, it says, before our baby was born, everyone said, are you excited to have a new playmate? And then she says, but playing with a new baby is like playing with a loaf of bread. So it's kind of a, a warm, uh, tell it like it is, combination between a picture book and a graphic novel. Another new book that I have is called Glacier on the Move. It's a picture book graphic novel hybrid. And in this story, uh, Flo, this glacier, basically narrates her journey from 
being born up in the high mountains to um, growing and growing and um, and reaching the sea. Um, and then there are these little ice worms that give the science in the background. So I'll show you this, this spread here. Kind of shows you the combination between the fiction and the nonfiction. Uh, Yahoo! Snow Day. I bet you thought I was made from frozen water, like an ice cube. I'm actually made from snow, so pile it on. I'm going to need tons to reach the sea. And then you can see here, tss, and this is um, as snow, the little, the little uh, ice worm says, as snow piles on a glacier, the weight presses air out, compacting the snow into dense ice. And then another little ice worm says, it takes 10 years for 10 feet of snow to become one foot of glacial ice. So it's kind of a fun, creative way to give kids a lot of science and sophisticated understanding about glaciers, but in a really fun and approachable way. Um, as you'll see, as you can see, a lot of these books um, kind of cross genres. So while they may be about invention or music or the environment or activism, they're also about history. And so, you know, you may be wondering, like with all this kind of wide variety of books, what really connects my books together? And one of the answers to that is me. Um, the books are all things that interest me, um, my approach towards research, um, and my voice is, you know, consistent across my work, just like it is for um, a lot of writers. What that means for you is that to use my books effectively, you can find out what interests kids and suggest books that feed their interests. Um, and you can also uh, kind of discuss the research that I did to write the books. I have lots of back matter in all of my books that talks about my research. And so that can be a way to inspire kids um, to, to think about the research behind a book. Um, and another really interesting thing is maybe having kids describe the voice of an author across books. And I think this would be especially interesting for nonfiction. It may be easier, um, more obvious with writers of fiction, but say for the volcano book, you know, there are three different volcano books. If you could have um, students read all three or read sections from all three and ask like, well, where is the voice? What is Elizabeth Rush's voice here? Another thing that connects my books is that I love story. So even though a lot of these books are nonfiction, they are still stories. They have interesting characters with goals. Those characters face obstacles and conflicts. There's a narrative arc with rising tension. There's often emotion. There are, there's cliffhangers that keep you on the edge of your seat. Um, there's some sort of exciting climax and then some kind of satisfying resolution. And that's true of both my fiction and my nonfiction. And how that may be useful to you is that you can suggest my books to kids who love fiction because they have the same feel as fiction. In fact, that's a lot of the feedback that I get from kids is that they can't believe it's a true story because it was so interesting. Um, the other thing that you can do is kind of compare the structure, the story structure in fiction and nonfiction and show how that story structure can still be very much the same. You could also pair nonfiction and fictional treatments of the same subject, uh, whether that's, you know, volcanoes or music or history, um, you know, have a fictional book and then, you know, a non-fictional uh, book to kind of show the similarities and the differences. Um, you can, in fact, use my books to teach story and to teach the narrative and the narrative arc. Um, especially the early picture books, it's a, they're very simple um, in a way that I think can make it obvious, more obvious to kids how a narrative arc actually works. Um, you know, I also think that you could use my books to encourage kids to write narrative nonfiction, that my books are not really sort of a list of facts, but that they're stories and maybe um, encouraging kids to write about true things, but write it as a story. Um, and then my picture books, you know, I, I almost feel like I could teach a class on like 
or collaborate with a teacher on this about like how to use picture books, nonfiction picture books as mentor text for older students, because all of those nonfiction books, um, the picture books, while they may be 32 to 48 pages long, I've read, you know, hundreds and hundreds of pages. Um, I've done all kinds of research and really boiled it down into something that's a, a short, clear, simple text. Um, and, you know, how I use research and how I use primary sources and interviews and all those things can be things that can be used to show, um, you know, say middle school or high school students how to uh, put together a quite sophisticated story, but that is also really simple. Another thing that connects my books is that I, um, I like to tell untold or missed stories, things that have been missed in popular culture or in the media. So my stories tell things like why Pluto is, you know, the why Pluto is not a planet, the people behind the Mars rovers, the volcanologists who are not really in the news um, when tragedy is averted, um, an inventor who's often overlooked. Everyone knows Edison, but not a lot of people know about Tesla. Um, kind of a, a different, a big picture of the health of our democracy. It's not a partisan view. It's really looking at how our democracy functions and how we st stray from the principle of one person, one vote, and how things might be different if we st uh, stuck with that principle. And even um, the 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 dog books, they're about dogs who surf and dogs who uh, are trained to save people who are buried under avalanches. And so they're stories that are, are not necessarily kind of in the mainstream. And so I hope that you can use my books to thrill kids with this feeling of discovery um, and really deepen their understanding of subject matter. Um, I hope that my books ask as many questions as they answer, and I hope that they change the way kids look at history and science and themselves and the world. And I think another thing that you could do is, you know, as a conversation after, you know, reading one of my books aloud or something, like ask students about stories that they know that have been missed and have them write stories that they think have been overlooked or missed. Another thing that connects my work, both my fiction and my nonfiction, is my extensive research and um, that I do for all of my work. Um, and uh, most of my books have back matter in which I, instead of just listing like a bibliography, I tell the story of how I did the, the research for the book. Um, and I think that that can be useful, again, as a model to help kids understand um, how you can do some really deep research on a topic. And finally, what connects my books is that I really want them to be useful. And I think this is particularly important at this time. Um, almost all of my books have um, uh, reading guides, teacher guides, activity guides with them. So you can go to elizabethrush.com and then go to the, the guides button. And for each book, it, sh it has links to free downloadable guides. Um, my book, my democracy book also has youcallthis.com, which has discussion guides with it. Um, I'm just going to give you a couple examples of the kinds of things you'll find there. For my Glacier on the Move book, there's an activity where kids can um, create a glacial timeline. So they pick a glacier and they look online for pictures of that glacier over time and, um, you know, see how that glacier has changed and how um, that uh, relates to the story in the book. There's a, a writing prompt, which basically says, you know, glaciers don't talk, but the author decided to have this glacier talk. Pick something um, in, from nature, a leaf, a rock, a cloud, an animal, a lake, give it a name and give it a voice and have it tell its story. And then there's also an art prompt, which shows, okay, well, glaciers don't really have an eyes or a mouth, but take that Thing from nature that you wrote about and draw a picture and give it an eyes and a face and expression. So those are just a few of the activities in that activity guide. It's like six pages long. Um, so there's lots in there that you can do. Um, the Avalanche Dog Hero book um, has, um, in actually in the back of the book, has a bunch of activities that kids can do. Um, like writing a resume for the ideal rescue dog as a kind of a writing activity. Um, 
uh, another writing activity could be like, um, if you have a pet at home and you want to train them to do something, what would be the steps that you would do to train them? And again, you can go back to the book and see how these dogs are trained and they can use that to, um, to do their own activity. Um, there are some common core guides, even for books for the very youngest students. So for Volcano Rising, um, I talk about text inferences, or, or the guide talks about text inferences that, um, you know, volcanoes, the book is basically about volcanoes are a force for good in the world, support with te examples from the text. Um, and then kind of a central idea or theme is that volcanoes are creative and um, what do they make is a question you can ask students. Um, how is the creative force theme presented and supported? Another really interesting one for this, and actually a lot of my books, is looking at word choice. What role does the use of sound words play in the book? And how does the author um, handle technological or, or geology terms, how those are handled? So word choice things. Um, you can talk about the structure of the book and also the point of view. Um, what, what voice are we hearing? And what does that voice tell you about what I think about volcanoes? The Music of Life has actually a full read aloud um, videotape with a pianist playing music to accompany the ideas. So that's something that you can play for your students. Um, it also has um, a list of music that kids, of piano music, that kids can think about um, and write about, you know, what do they think this piece of music is saying about life and why do they think that? So you can kind of have a literacy and music kind of go hand in hand. Um, the Electrical Wizard book um, also talks about word choice. Um, find and list all the wor words related to wizardry or magic. What role do these words play in the book? Um, so that's something you'll find if you look at my books. Word choice is something that I use uh, a lot to make you feel something. So you read about Tesla and you feel the sense of wonder and you don't know why. Well, it's actually because of the words that I chose. Um, this is a great book to talk about point of view. The book focuses on Tesla's point of view. How would it have been different if the author had chosen to give equal time to Tesla and Edison's points of views? Which inventor did you know about before reading The Electrical Wizard? How might this have affected uh, my decision to focus on Tesla? So you can kind of dig into some point of view questions. I even have science in my graphic novel. Uh, Money Max in the back has activities to look at what is actually in mud. I learned all kinds of things um, when I was doing research for this book about what is in mud, including uh, dead bug carcasses and nematodes. Um, and there's an actual activity to, uh, to where kids can go outside and get some mud and take a look at it. And that's you know something that they can do at home. Um, there are some pretty hefty questions related to the next wave about, um, you know, why I wrote the book, what perfect purpose, um, does it serve and what's my point of view, um, and how I tell multiple stories to tell a, you know, one complete story. Um, and, um, so you can really dig into some structure issues with that book. Oh my gosh, the Mighty Mars Rovers. This is a tiny piece of the guide that's in there. There's all kinds of hands-on stuff, communication, writing, engineering. This is just a really fun one where you challenge students to draw a picture of their own idea of what a Mars Rover should do. And it should be specific about what tasks it should perform and what pieces it has to have on it. How would it land? How would it move across the ground? How would it work on unstable ground? How is it powered? How does it collect samples? What does it do with those samples? So you can actually get into quite a sophisticated um, engine and fun engineering project um, through that. And I believe there might even be a, like a worksheet that talks through those questions online. Um, there's hands-on things with my volcano books, um, about how you can make a, um, like a volcano, um, a volcanic explosion. Um, but the other thing that, um, that I do is that you can also kind of connect books to current events. 
So like with my asteroid book, um, there are actually fireballs spotted across the country and across the world all the time. And there's a website called the American Meteor Society that tracks them. And so a student could, you know, pick their region of the country or somewhere else and read about, you know, um, new asteroids that have, um, have made it through the atmosphere and do research on that. There's also things, um, that um, if students have telescopes, they can actually look for asteroids as part of this citizen project. So I also can, you know, you can also use my resources to connect books with uh, current events, things that are happening right now. And, um, you know, and another way that you could do this is kind of paralleling books with things that are happening actually today with the, the COVID uh, pandemic. So three of my books, two that are out and one that's coming out this this August, are all about the science of saving lives. So there's Asteroids and the Science of Saving Lives, uh, Volcanoes and the Science of Saving Lives, and then the one that's coming out in August is the Cascadia Earthquakes and the Science of Saving Lives. <clears throat> and you could actually, I think, do this with books from other writers too, but ask like, how are these dis disasters the same or different from the global pandemic. Um, how can we, what can we learn from these other kinds of disasters to help us through this crisis? So I think that you can also find ways to link, you know, uh, some of my books to things that are happening that are quite current um, in, in kids' lives. Another thing um, that I think would be quite timely right now um, with, uh, um, you know, middle school or high school students is um, to really delve in deep and have discussions and debates about the state of our democracy. This is an election year. These are conversations that you can have that have nothing to do with who is running for president and whether you're a Democrat or a Republican, but really ask greater questions about, you know, should we use the Electoral College or should we add up the votes in a national popular vote? Um, questions about gerrymandering, you know, should politicians be able to draw their own, um, the borders of their own voting districts, or should that be in the hands of citizens? And should um, people be able to donate as much as they want to political campaigns? And what role does money play in, um, in, our, in our policies? You know, what should the voting age be? Why is it 18? Maybe it should be 16. So these are things that um, are really timely. They're really juicy, can give young people something to jump into. Um, so with this book, I have on my website, actually both my websites, um, really thorough discussion questions um, by, you know, overall and by chapter to spur discussion. And those can happen online um, or... I'm offering, um, especially for this time when everyone is stuck at home, I'm offering fee free a free 15-minute virtual author visit for any five or more people who read You Call This Democracy. So this can be teens, this could be adults, these could be a group of, of smart middle schoolers. Um, and all they have to do is, you know, uh, email me and um, and set up a time. They'll have to get copies of the book and, and read them ahead of time. And uh, we'll find a way to connect online um, and, uh, and talk about the book and talk about the future of our democracy. As you know, I also make connections through school visits. Um, I have started to develop some virtual school visits, um, which I'll make available uh, for a... Um, uh, smaller than my normal fee. But I think that there's sort of a hidden connection with all of this. Um, Steve Squires, who is the head of the Mars Rover program, once said, what connects all this for me is that I simply love to explore. I love doing something nobody else has done, going someplace no one else has ever been, and discovering stuff that no one has ever seen. Me too. That's how I feel about my work. So thank you for joining me in my office for uh, this um, exploration of what connects my books and how you can use them to connect to students. 
You can learn more about all of my books and get the teacher's guides at elizabethrush.com. There's a special website for the democracy book called youcallthis.com. On my website, you can sign up for a newsletter that I send out somewhere between once a year and once every two years. Um, please join me on Facebook at author Elizabeth Rush, on Twitter at, at Elizabeth Rush. Feel free to email me with questions um, or if you wanna set up some kind of a, a virtual um, book club discussion. And um, thank you for listening. Stay safe, stay healthy, and keep reading. Thank you.